grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. With these words of Paul to the church in Rome, I welcome you to this podcast service from the Pottestro Methodist Church. Today's message will be guided by selected verses from the first letter of John and will revisit the wonderful theme of God's love for us and what he expects from all who have recognized and accepted his love for their lives. My name is Edward Brown and I am one of the pastoral staff in this church here in this college town in Central South Africa. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Beloved, only begotten Son, Jesus, precious Holy Spirit, accept our praise and adoration. Bowing before you, we turn our mind's eye to the wonders of your creation. By day, we see the minute details of your handiwork in the intricacies of life around us. The vibrant beauty of the winter flowers standing out in stark contrast to the pale dry grasses. The liquid melody of songbirds calling to attract mates with which to start new life in the spring, for which we are all waiting eagerly. By night, the vastness of your universe unfolds as the stars appear, more than have been counted, and we remember that you created them all and call each one by name. And in the midst of all the splendor, we are reminded that you care for us in the most personal of ways the loving, caring Father God, who longs to gather us to yourself as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. We thank you for the undeserved love that expressed itself in the gift of your Son Jesus to the world, and how that love shared within your divine trinity was so great for us that in your omniscience you reckoned that the death of the beloved Son on the cross was not too great a price to pay to free the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve from the burden of sin and death. Precious Spirit of Truth, you who proceed from the Father and the Son, and are God's gentle voice who comes to us to lead us through the turmoil of our lives, we ask that you come and take up residence in our hearts. And then, Lord God, Father, Blessed Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, please empower us that we might share with others the love that your grace has shown us and become your hands to touch the broken people and communities around us. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus and share in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn for today is by the Irish hymn writer Mary Shackleton. Born in 1827, Mary was her parents' fourth daughter, and only six months old when her mother was widowed. Life for the family was difficult, and when Mary contracted tuberculosis at a relatively early age, she would be sickly throughout her life. This did not, however, break her spirit or cause her to become full of self-pity. Deeply committed to God's grace and always aware of his love for her, she wrote hymns of praise to her Lord and established a postal ministry for hundreds of shut-in folk and invalids across Britain. She died in 1883, aged 56. It is with this background knowledge that her hymn, It Passes Knowledge, That Dear Love of Thine, gains a special meaning for all who have blessed by her ministry today. This is hymn number 434 in the Methodist hymnal. Let us hear the words of praise of Mary. It passes knowledge, that dear love of thine, my Saviour, Jesus. Yet this soul of mine would of thy love in all its breadth and length, its height and depth and everlasting strength, know more and more. It passes telling, that dear love of thine, my Saviour, Jesus. Yet these lips of mine, 
would fain proclaim to sinners far and near a love which can remove all guilty fear and love beget. It passes praises, that dear love of thine, my Saviour, Jesus. Yet this heart of mine would sing that love so full, so rich, so free, which brings a rebel sinner such as me nigh unto God. O fill me, Saviour, Jesus, with thy love. Lead, lead me to the living fount above. Thither may I in simple faith draw nigh, and never to another fountain fly, but unto thee. And then when Jesus face to face I see, when at his lofty throne I bow the knee, then of his love, in all its breadth and length, its height and depth, its everlasting strength, my soul shall sing. The lessons for today, as I said earlier, are selected verses from the first letter of John. And I start at chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Then moving on to verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Then moving on to chapter 4, we continue from verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him, and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Ever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God 
must also love their brother and sister. May God bless these scriptures to our understanding. Amen. My theme this morning is everyone needs love. Every now and again, our old German shepherd comes up to me and rubs his head against my legs. I know what he wants, love. He's begging me to rub him back, to scratch him behind his ears and under his chin. And as I do that, he rubs all the harder against me with a look that says, I love you. Every human and most animals want to be loved. It is one of the most basic of needs. The need to be loved is so strong that many people look for it in all the wrong places and from people who will exploit them, just so they can feel loved. Decades ago, I heard the testimony of an American lady evangelist who spoke of how her need for love as a young student caused her to pass through the hands of more men than she could remember. One day, a fellow student challenged her to meet a man who would not exploit her, but who would love her for who she was. And so she met Jesus, and her life was never without love again. And this is the good news of the ages. There is a source of love that is available to all who desire it. God has supplied it in the person of his son Jesus. Because Jesus has brought a new kind of love to the world. In his letter to the church, John the Apostle of Love shared what he had learnt about the Heavenly Father's love through his long life. The first verse that we read from John's letter tells us plainly how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Now it's one thing for God to just say that he loves us. But as we know, talk is cheap. God also knows that. And so he showed his love for us in the most decisive and spectacular way possible. He sent his only begotten Son the eternal Christ that we know as Jesus of Nazareth to earth to reach out to people and to reveal God's love. Actually, by what I have said, I have just committed a serious error and detracted from what God did. Because God did more than just send his son. In Christ Jesus' encounter with the old rabbi Nicodemus, as recorded in John 3 verse 16, Jesus told the old respected scholar that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is a vast difference between sending and giving. Every parent has at some time or other sent their son somewhere to do something or to buy something. But none of us have ever felt so strongly about an issue that we have given our son to that project. As someone said, the fact that God loves us so much that he gave us his son is proof that we never have to be afraid of him. Respect him, yes. Worship him, yes. But never fear him, because he is the one who calls us his children. One of the points that emerges from the Bible is that God is picky about who he calls his children. The wondrous angelic creatures that are called the seraphim, and which are forever in his presence praising him, are not called his children. Neither are the mighty angels and archangels, even though we know the names of some of them, like Michael and Gabriel. No, the ones that God calls his children are those who are descended from the man and the woman that he made in his image. Us. For a reason that God alone knows, he has chosen not only to love us, but to elevate us to the undeserved and exalted position of being his children. John tells us that in his letter that God is love. In other words, God's nature is love. And that love was revealed in the giving of his son. To understand this gift of love in the person of Jesus, we need to unpack it. When I give a gift, I transfer ownership of that gift to its new owner. When God gave Jesus to the world, he transferred all his rights that he had to his son to the world. Now when I give something, I always do so with the hope that the new owner will appreciate it and look after it as they use it. God did not have that illusion or expectation. The Heavenly Father knew that after receiving the gift of Jesus, 
that the world would grab him, use him, and exploit him as much as they could. And then when he had no further use for him, would crucify him on the city of Jerusalem's rubbish dump, Golgotha. But because God's love is part of his nature, and because of his love for us, he still gave his son, despite knowing all the shame, suffering, hatred, agony and cruelty that awaited Jesus. God has proven in the most radical of ways that he loves us. If, as I said earlier, actions speak louder than words, then Jesus' death on the cross trumpets God's words, I love you, down the centuries to us today. God's love is seen in the life of Jesus. Now there is an important point that we must always remember, and that is that although God gave his son Jesus to us, that Jesus was a full participant in the process. Jesus was a willing gift. He totally bought into God's plan. John makes this point in chapter 3, verse 16, where he writes, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. John then goes further to encourage us to study Jesus' pattern of love and to follow in his footsteps. And Jesus' love was not restricted in any way. This was one of the aspects about his ministry that the Jewish authorities could never understand. They taught that Jews should love other Jews and just ignore everyone else. But Jesus wasn't like that. He extended his care and concern to the outcast folk, like those who had leprosy. He touched them in body to heal their minds and spirit as well. He spoke to foreigners and healed the sick child of a Greek woman from the region of what had been the land of the hated Philistines. He took a few days out of his schedule to minister to an entire Samaritan town when other Jews were taught to bypass the region completely. He dined with the hated tax collectors and their party girls. In fact, he never made anyone feel unwelcome. Jesus knew that they all needed to be loved. He saw every man, woman and child that he encountered as being of value to his father, as people with the potential to be God's children. This kind of love was the pattern that John advocated for the church. And he was not just talking about something that he did not ascribe to. He was known as the apostle of love. He hadn't always been like that. In fact, during the time that John and his brother James had been Jesus' students, well, that is the word, what the word disciple means. Jesus had teasingly nicknamed them the sons of thunder because of their hot tempers. In fact, on one occasion, when another Samaritan village had treated Jesus badly, the brothers asked their master for permission to pray that God would send holy fire to destroy them. You can read that in Luke chapter 9 from verse 51. But over the decades since then, God's Holy Spirit had transformed John into the man known to love everyone. In his letter, John wrote, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. John would ask us, as he no doubt asked himself, can people see Jesus in me? Our response should be to ask also, who is the neighbor or brother or sister in Christ that God wants me to love today? When we go out in love, this question will soon be answered very quickly and easily. Because our natural inclination is only to love those who love us or share our values, we need to look seriously at loving others. And all too often, we want others to change before we show them love. But Jesus' love includes everyone. And we as his followers should actively seek to share God's love with them. There is something that few individuals understand about God's love for us. Namely, that it is exclusive for us as individuals. God loves you in a way that is unique and exclusive because he made you to be unique. His love for you is tailor-made for you. 
He has never loved anyone the way that he loves you. And he never will. Someone once asked a mother of a large family about her love for her children. She told her interrogator that she loved them equally but differently because they were all so different. One of the great tragedies for God is that he loves everyone that has ever lived in that fashion. But the vast majority have never responded to him and so they have left holes in his father's heart. This exclusive love from God demands that we love Him in the same way, exclusively. When we decide to accept God's love and love Him, it means we are called to a relationship like monogamous marriage. There is no place for another. When we choose to love the holy God, we can no longer have a relationship with the unholy world. We are called to love the people in the world, but to hate their sin. John puts it as, Do not love the world or anything in the world. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has done, comes not from the Father, but from the world. That's in chapter 2 of his letter. God's love for us is also without end. In Jeremiah 31 verse 3, God revealed to the prophet that his love for his people was eternal. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Although these words were spoken to the nation Israel, all who embraced God's Son, and whom he has called sisters and brothers, share in that love. Paul, writing to the Roman church in chapter 8 from verse 38 onwards, said, I am convinced that neither death or life, neither angels nor demons, Neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so to close, probably no word in any language is so misunderstood and abused as the word thought of as love. It is applied without thought to our favorite foods and to clothing fashions. Not to forget romantic relationships and even to religious experiences. It is easy to spell, but it is a concept that a philosopher can spend a life exploring. And because of that, God has shown us what love is in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Let us share him with the world and give it what it needs most, love. Amen. Because we've been sitting at John the Beloved Apostle's feet today, it is only fitting that we close off this time with his benediction as found in Revelations 1. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from God, from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Amen.